Alrighty, we are on to part three in our year-long walk through the liturgical calendar. Part three is the season of Epiphany Tide, the, uh, the season following the day of Epiphany, lasting until, well, <laughs> we'll get to that next time. So, happy Epiphany Tide. By the time this video goes up, it will be Epiphany. Uh, yeah, yeah, we're on a Tuesday schedule for this, so it'll be the day after Epiphany, second day of that season. So, happy Epiphany Tide. What's this season about? What does Epiphany even mean? Aha! I have an Epiphany! But I forget what it is. Okay, yes, an Epiphany is a showing forth. Um, like a, you know, we, we sometimes use it to mean something like a realization or a great idea, um, but it's really more of a revelation, a showing forth, uh, Epiphanos, Epiphanos. Epiphany, to show forth. Um, that's sort of the, the words that is com coming from there. So to show forth or to make manifest or to reveal. Uh, so specifically, Epiphany is about the showing forth or manifestation of Jesus as God. That's the major theme, revealing the divinity of Christ. This man uh, working miracles, that baby who was born, and that child uh, who was growing up has been revealed to be not just a man, not just a baby, not just a child, not just a man, but God himself in the flesh, God incarnate. So right off the bat there, you can see that this is kind of a flip side relationship with Christmas. Christmas being God has come down in the person of a baby, it has, has, has become flesh. And, and so we celebrate the humanity of, of Jesus and what that means for our human nature as a result. Epiphany Tide continues that both narratively and theologically as that baby is then worshiped and adored by the wise men and is baptized by John the Baptist and does all these miracles and has all these great teachings. All this reveals in various ways, that he is God, and yet also man. So it's sort of the the, the flip side of Christmas. So Epiphany is a, an important um, well event and season in the church calendar for mainly that reason. So uh, that's that's the big thing. It's 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 really that simple. It's really that focused um, historically. Uh, the Epiphany season was very focused on that theme, and it was pretty straightforward. You would have, um, in the traditional arrangement, you would have up to six Sundays in this Epiphany season, leading up until whenever the pre-Lent season begins, and um, what you would have are a series of epiphanies for each of those days. Um, oh, like liturgical colors too, um, which I should mention along the way. Um, traditionally, you would have um, white or, you know, the festal colors um, at the beginning um, for the Epiphany Day through the first Sunday of Epiphany, just sort of to walk through that octave, that first week. Um, and then green after that. So it's sort of like, like Trinity Tide, it's sort of an ordinary-ish period of time. Um, so nothing particularly festal, nothing particularly penitential, just sort of the, the regular green season feel to things as you go through the epiphany season. And that's generally how it's uh, followed today, although I'll get into some of the differences later on. So the historical sort of contour or arc of the epiphany season, uh, you start with Epiphany Day, January 6th. You know, the 12 days of Christmas have ended, and then you get to January 6th, Epiphany, and that is when we celebrate the adoration of the Magi. The wise men or the kings, whatever, uh, have arrived and, and bring their gifts to Jesus and his family, and they worship him. That right there. They come, they give him these kingly gifts, and they worship him. That right there is um, the first Epiphany, the first realization that this baby is God. You know, apart from, you know, the angels singing about it on, on the night of his birth. But, you know, you know one season at a time, right? So um, Epiphany begins with that. In the prayer book tradition, that would also be paired with a couple other things, um, especially the baptism of Jesus. Um, that would be read in the daily offices on that day. And then you would 
you know, sort of carry on with the uh, with the season from there. And a couple different prayer books have have changed exactly how this sorts it out, um, so that certain books will separate the baptism of Jesus to be on the first Sunday or one of the early Sundays in the season. Uh, so you know, a couple couple variations in in the old tradition there. Um, but then after that, you know, going through the other epiphanies in, in the gospel lessons for the various Sundays, um, you'll find other epiphanies like the finding of Jesus in the temple when he's discussing at age 12 with the, with the priests and, and, and teachers there. Um, the wedding in Cana, the first sign, the first big miracle that he does. Um, you get one of his healing miracles, the cleansing of a leper and healing of another sick servant. You get the parable of the wheat and the tares or the wheat and the weeds where Jesus is talking about his authority to, you know, separate the wheat and the weeds at the end of the age. And then the last epiphany, uh, which is often uh, lost if, if, if Lent starts early, is um, at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, basically, uh, the sign of the coming of the Son of Man. So that's from his um, discourse um, shortly before the Passion. So you have that sort of progression of different epiphanies and re revealings or revelations of Jesus to be God. That is how it used to work. And the epistle lessons sort of going along with those, matching with each of those gospels, um, interestingly enough, four of them are from the book of Romans. So it's as if the the reading of the epistles in the old lectionary was starting at the beginning of the epistles <laughs> at the beginning of the year uh, with romans and then going on so that's sort of a neat um, sort of pattern in there as well but anyway that's the background of the historical uh, approach to epiphany but uh, as a priest in the Anglican Church in North America, I need to walk you through what the 2019 prayer book does, which is our new, and uh, for most most dioceses in this province, I think, our official prayer book. So in our situation with this new calendar, Epiphany Tide is really quite different. It's the most changed part of the church year um, in many ways. And um, when you compare our new prayer book with the 1979 prayer book, um, you will find that Epiphany Tide remains the most changed, even now, from how it used to work um, in the classical tradition. So on Epiphany Day, January 6th, we still have this celebration of the, the arrival of the Magi, Matthew chapter 2, the first 12 or so verses, and we have that you know, celebration, Three Kings Day, as, as it's known in some cultures. The first Sunday in Epiphany Tide celebrates the baptism of Jesus, and the second Sunday in Epiphany Tide uh, takes from its gospel takes for its gospel lesson something from John chapters one or two. So some so one year that includes the wedding of Cana, which is the traditional historic reading, uh, I think for that very Sunday. So that's that's a nice tie-in, but it does include some of the earlier stuff from uh, chapter one in, of John's gospel. After that. It departs from the traditional epiphany course entirely and starts on the relatively sequential walkthrough of the gospel of the year. So the modern calendar has three years, A, B, and C, um, each one following the gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, respectively. So right now it's year A, so we're in uh, Gospel of Matthew. That's going to be the, the focus for most of this year. So after the first two Sundays of Epiphany Tide, we'll jump into Matthew chapter 4, I believe, and start the walkthrough uh, bit by bit through that Gospel. And it'll stop and during Lent, and it'll be picked back up again after Trinity Sunday, where we'll just walk through the majority, I guess, of the Gospel according to St. Matthew for the other green season after Trinity. So that's kind of how it works. It's sort of this sequential period of time. And, you know, again, the Old, Te the Old Testament lessons match with the Gospels. Uh, but what's happening with the epistles during Ep Epiphany Tide is, uh, for all three years, is that we're sort of outlining 1 Corinthians and a bit of 2 Corinthians. Um, I 
in the previous three years of, of the calendar cycle, I preached through First Corinthians um, over the in, in you know in three chunks, you know, for each of the three years, and that was a fun experience. It's a neat book to fit into uh, into the Epiphany season. Um, it it doesn't. It, it doesn't you know dwell very much on the revelation the epiphany of Jesus as God specifically but it does you know deal with a lot of the um, liturgical and especially ethical implications of that for us as God's people so you know, it's a good book you know, for any time really but it's just what happens to be featured uh, in in our lectionary um, also in Oh, oh, it was, it, and and so the end of Epiphany Tide. I promise I'd get to this. Uh, the ending of this season is a little different in our tradition, especially the new 2019 prayer book. Um, we have the last Sunday, which is called Transfiguration Sunday, and this is a bit of a controversial sticking point for some because we already have a holid holiday for the transfiguration. You know, when Jesus was on the mountain, transfigured, bright, shining white clothes and everything, and very clear uh, revelation that of his divinity showing forth. We have a holiday for that in August. <laughs> and so it's weird for many of us to see it doubled here as a Sunday at the end of the Epiphany season. But when you look at that story, that incident, the, that transfiguration of Jesus, it is a fantastic example of, of, of an epiphany, of a revelation, a revealing of the divinity of Jesus. And because the transfiguration takes place shortly before Jesus sets his eyes upon Jerusalem and goes there where he would then be killed, um, it's a great, great turning point event to link epiphany to Lent as you point your way towards Good Friday and Easter. Um, so it's one of those awkward situations where um, you want to be grumpy because it's um, it's a modern thing. It was only invented in the 20th century, and why did we have to change all of our you know marvelous you know calendar history and tradition um, so much? But this this little change, as annoying as it is, it makes a lot of sense. So I mean, if you're able to embrace you know work with the modern calendar, th it, it's a it's a really good feature even if it, it has its annoying points for the traditionalist. Um, something else that's brand new for the Anglican Church in North America is World Mission Sunday. Um, this is not quite mandated in the 2019 prayer book, but it is recommended and expected as the default as the second to last Sunday in Epiphany Tide. And uh, the... In, in, in the draft prayer book before it was finished, it, it, it looked a bit different for a while, uh, but now it's just all out um, a day to celebrate and focus on the mission of the church. And that's actually kind of one of the subtle or not so subtle underlying themes of Epiphany Tide in modern calendars like ours. It's one of mission. And at first, you know, the traditionalist might say, well, what does that have to do with the showing forth of the glory of the Lord in the person of Jesus Christ? Um, we're supposed to be celebrating and focusing on this theological truth of the divinity of Jesus. Um, but actually, um, linking the mission, uh, proclaiming the gospel to that is a very natural thing. I mean, in a way that, that links to pretty much anything in the gospel, but if you think about where Epiphany starts, we've got Gentiles, non-Jews, coming to seek out this new king, Jesus, and to worship him because they recognize something of who he is. And some of the traditional Old Testament texts that come up around Epiphany have to do with the ingathering of the nations, the Gentiles, all the world coming to worship God in Jerusalem or in the heavenly Jerusalem, picture of heaven, uh, picture of the church. So it makes sense that this showing forth of the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ should then be extended to the work of mission, proclaiming that glory, proclaiming that gospel to all the world. Uh, whether or not that merits uh, inventing a world mission Sunday on top of all of that more subtle th thematic content, well, I'll, I'll let that 
you know, be a conversation for other people to have and a debate to carry out. Um, but it is um, interesting to, to note that we have it here as an option. And it does feed into the general sort of, you know, resultant theme of Epiphany. Also, um, along the course of the Epiphany season, there are three holidays in January and February. Um, I, for the most part, I'm dealing with holidays at the end of this series you know, on their own, but there are three in here that actually fit into the Epiphany season rather specifically and really well. Um, there's um, the Feast of the Presentation of Christ in the Temple on February 2nd. That's the 40th day of Christmas, so to speak, and you can learn more about that in the previous video in the series back in uh, Christmas Tide, uh, because I mentioned it then. It's sort of like the, an extension of Christmas pushing into uh, the Epiphany season. But the other two, there are two in January, the Confession of Peter and the Conversion of Paul. Both of these also are fantastic epiphanies. Uh, the Confession of Peter, um, this is when Jesus asks, who do, you, who do people say that I am? And the apostles give all these answers. Now, who do you say that I am? And Peter confesses the divinity of Jesus, basically. Uh, so again, that's a great epiphany. Um, fits right into the theme of the season, and it's it's not one of the old prayer book holidays, but it fits right in. So it's it's a great, great epiphany celebration. Uh, the conversion of Paul also, again, you know, <laughs> the glory of the Lord shining and bl literally blinding Paul on the road to Damascus. And, oh, okay, <laughs> this guy I've been persecuting is God. Time to turn completely around. <laughs> and thus the greatest missionary bishop ever was uh, born again, basically, he baptized shortly thereafter. So those two holidays in January also um, feed into this epiphany theme and, and season really well. So if they land on Sundays, celebrate them. Seriously, we're allowed to in the modern, in, 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 in this prayer book. We don't have to transfer them off to a Monday or something. They fit really well into the Epiphany scheme of things. So when they land on Sunday, which I think will happen next year in 2021, um, let's go for it because they're totally worth it. Um, anyway, so that's, that's a, a quick walkthrough of what the 2019 prayer book does for the Epiphany season. Um, I, I, I would have glanced, I was, I was going to glance at the Daily Office Lectionary uh, just in case there was anything there that feeds into the Epiphany season, but it doesn't, it doesn't really in this case. Sometimes it does um, incidentally, in this case not so much. It's just the beginning of the calendar year, um, so we're starting at the beginning of, of these different reading tracks. Um, so no, no major connection there in, in our daily um, scripture readings. Uh, but the last thing is um, other features of the liturgy. And I hinted at this before, um, but I want to bring it back now. The uh, Old Testament lessons that have to do with the epiphany theme of the ingathering of the nations or, or the bringing in of the Gentiles to believe in, in, in God, the God of Israel. We have a number of canticles, um, psalm prayers, if you like, that um, that can be used in our book, in our prayer book, and one of them is from Isaiah chapter 60, which is one of the traditional readings associated with Epiphany Day or early in the Epiphany season. This canticle is called the Surge Illuminare, um, and um, I wanted to sort of share that at the end here to you know, bring that thematic content to you as a wrap-up and sort of introduction to um, this great season. There it is. All right. If you'll pardon the little glitchiness there. Surge Illuminare, uh, Arise, Shine, for Your Light Has Come. Um, so this is excerpts from Isaiah chapter 60. Um, you can read the whole chapter. It's pretty fantastic. A great way of introducing this season. Uh, but I just wanted to close this with reading you what we have here. This is page 80 in the 2019 prayer book, Canticle 2, Surge Illuminare. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has dawned upon you. For behold, darkness covers the land, deep gloom enshrouds the peoples. But over you, 
the Lord will rise, and his glory will appear upon you. Nations will stream to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawning. Your gates will always be open. By day or night they will never be shut. They will call you the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Violence will no more be heard in your land, ruin or destruction within your borders. You will call your walls salvation, and all your portals praise. The sun will no more be your light by day. By night you will not need the brightness of the moon. The Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.